of art. And what surprises a lot of people is that one piece can have multiple values depending on the purpose of the appraisal. So just to break it down really quick, for example, insurance is about replacement value. So if the unforeseeable should happen to your artwork tomorrow, then you want to be able to go out into the marketplace the next day and replace it. So as a consequence, that's usually retail. Um, and with an artist's work, for example, I had a gentleman call me, and he's a graphic artist. He's actually a graphic novelist, and very successful in Europe, published several books, and has original artwork, um, but has never had it appraised. He's never sold the original artwork, and the concern is, what if something happens to the studio? So in a discussion with a woman at Huntington Block Insurance, she would accept an appraisal from me where I looked at comparable artists who are also graphic and comic novel artists um, to see what is selling on the retail market through galleries to establish an appropriate value for the artwork, again, if it needed to be replaced. In terms of insurance, the insurance company would then compensate the artist up to 70% of the likely retail value, recognizing that in a transaction, say through a gallery, there's going to be a commission paid to the seller. So, um, and then on a collector side, of course, it's going to be full retail, again, because you likely purchase that piece in a gallery. When we look at valuations for donation purposes, the IRS stipulates that it should be valued at fair market value. And this is a, a commonly used term, and yet it's somewhat nebulous. Um, the definition of fair market value is willing buyer, willing seller, neither under compulsion to, to sell or to buy, and all parties having knowledge of the relevant facts. What's in the second portion of that definition is that it has to be in the market where the work is most commonly traded. So with an artist that's been gone for, say, 25, 30, 50 years, it is most likely that that artist's work is going to be commonly traded on the secondary market, auctions, for example, as opposed to retail, even though there may be a retail presence through some galleries. With contemporary artists, it's most likely going to be retail, commercial, through galleries, etc. So fair market value can mean actually different things depending on the artist and where their work is most commonly traded, if they're still active, etc. Um, and this also goes for estates. So again, the IRS stipulates fair market value. Um, and you determine, again, where the work is most commonly traded. You also look at the history of sales in determining the value of the inventory. What's different about the evaluation of an estate of artist's work is that I, as the appraiser, have the liberty to apply blockage discount. Now, blockage discount is a premise that comes from Wall Street, it's stocks. So, and the idea is if you flood the stock market with stock of a very specific company, it is most likely that you're going to saturate the market and as a consequence, the value is going to deflate. So that premise is also applied to an artist's inventory. If you suddenly flood the market with all the inventory that that maker has made, you will most likely deflate the overall value. As a consequence, I can apply blockage discount to the overall value of the artist's inventory in an estate. And there is precedent for this, both in the Georgia O'Keeffe estate and uh, one of my favorite court um, cases, the Andy Warhol estate. <laughs> and the reason we have the Andy Warhol estate available to us is because the lawyer 
who represented the estate of Andy Warhol, decided that he would base his fee on the end value of the estate. Now, obviously this individual anticipated that it would be a stupendous sum of money. Um, but the appraisers, actually I think they were from Sotheby's, though it could have been Christie's, applied blockage discount. Again, this idea if you flood the market, you deflate the value. And then also looking at other aspects, for example, Andy Warhol avidly took Polaroids of friends and celebrities and acquaintances at parties, at Studio 54, etc. So there was a stockpile of Polaroids in the Andy Warhol estate. Now anyone who is even remotely familiar with Andy Warhol and the history of, of sales with regards to his work would expect that those would have value. They're going to sell, right? But at the time of death, he had never sold any, ever. They were personal. As a consequence, those got a value of zero for the estate <coughs> appraisal. Um, then another type of appraisal, for example, can be liquidation value. Uh, this is where you need to move things fast. You put, again, another discount in order to move move the material. So these are the different types of appraisals that I work with. And I, it's usually, again, it's fine art photography, it's contemporary art, um, I do Northwest art, etc., which is very different from the copyright licensing and royalty. So it is definitely a separate entity. Um, one of the things that um, Ellen brought up is that we work together on an estate, again, very well-established photographer who had a major celebrity sitting in the 60s. Uh, this gentleman, his career crashed and burned in the 70s. He resurfaced in the 80s. And this one celebrity sitting was his cash cow to the end of his life. What is very sad about this scenario is this man had a 50-year career. There was um, an apartment in the city. There was a house out on the island. Uh, there were boxes upon boxes upon boxes of prints, ephemera, documents, etc. And as this gentleman aged, um, his widow reported to us that his lawyers repeatedly said, you need to make a plan, you need to get this stuff organized, you need, you need to make decisions. And he literally turned to them and said, oh, she'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, when we were called in for this appraisal, it, the widow had hired a young archivist to start going through the boxes and documenting everything. By the time we came on site, this young man, in the course of nine months, had documented 6,000 items. And that wasn't even half of it. That wasn't even the negatives. That was just print material. Um, and above and beyond that, what was worse is every box was literally put together by Pandora because there were work prints, there were finished prints, there were gelatin silver prints, <laughs> there were digital prints, there were newspaper clippings. Every box had this smorgasbord of material and some of them were relevant and some of them were not, which as a consequence, we spent a lot of time going through and sorting and the widow was going through file cabinets and digging for receipts. It was literally a worst case scenario. And on top of that, this lovely woman was in mourning. It's really, really sad. And um, so that is, that is exactly what you want to avoid. And one of the key things that a lot of photographers and artists is they want a legacy. They've been creators for their entire 
professional career. For many fine art photographers, it's about leaving their work at a museum, leaving it in an archive, having um, their history preserved, how they fit into a larger historical continuum. So it's really important to start those conversations with the institutions early when you're active, when you um, have a relationship with that archive or institution. You need to make sure that your work is relevant. So for example, um, universities often have special collections that have repositories for photographs. And these can be local photographers, regional photographers, it can be photojournalists, it can be someone who was connected significantly to the artistic community, just the history of a specific city, um, the architecture, etc. Because those sorts of research institutions are interested in putting together and preserving material that a researcher or scholar could come in and they could literally get a picture of what was going on at that time. And as a consequence, they don't just want the photograph. And they, they would also like to have the negative, if possible. But they want all the ancillary material. They want the record keeping. They want the notes that you took when you were on site. Why were you there? What were you working on? Who was there? Did you get the release? These are significant, especially as cities change, as the geography changes, for example. Um, that is exceptionally important. It's also exceptionally important to recognize that museums tend to focus almost specifically on the fine art itself. They're not archives. They don't want your papers, um, with rare exception. And unless it is a key figure who is very significant to that institution. So there's also the issues analog versus digital. Talking to the institution early, these conversations can be five years, seven years, 10 years. Um, they can last longer. You have to recognize that they have physical storage issues. They also have digital storage issues. Um, I work with a special collections director down in Oregon. If a photographer comes to him and says, I have a database of 250,000 digital images, I'm going to ask him or her to dwindle it down to 150 of their best. If it's a print collection, they have to figure out how much room do I have? Where can I keep it? Literally. Uh, I need to plan for that. I need to figure out how much shelving I can put, how many boxes. Um, the other issue as well is digitization. Uh, for example, the Princeton Museum, which has a significant collection of minor white, I just read that they got a grant, let's see, um, in 2014, the Princeton University Art Museum received a gift of $99,493 plus $100,523, which actually comes out to $200,007, which I wonder if that was a lucky number kind of a thing. <laughs> and the purpose was to complete the digitization and cataloging of their photographic archive of minor white, which contains more than 5,000 images. So I calculated this out. Oh, plus other photographic materials. 5,000 images. If we estimate that there might be a thousand other documents of photographic material, that $200,000 breaks down to about $33 per piece in terms of digitization. So that's the cost of labor associated with taking in an archive. And that's another component that 
is very unpleasant, unfortunately, in terms of why so many institutions are saying no. And it's not that they want to say no. Sometimes, again, they just don't have the capacity, they don't have the financial means to take it in, to archive it. There is a um, institution in Oregon, um, wonderful institution that has gone on hard times. They literally have a backlog of 20 years that they haven't been able to get to. Um, it's a state-funded organization. Again, they've run into some financial issues. So those are the other things you want to think about when you start a conversation with an institution about your archive. Again, going back to relevance. How does your work fit with their mission? How does it service the research? How does it you know, fill out a bigger picture? And then thinking about who's going to use this material? Who's going to access my archive? Will they be able to access my archive? And above and beyond that, with the digital material, the archivists are estimating 10-year lifespan. And every time you transfer, you lose data. You've got bit rot issues now. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of little things to think about. But the most important component, and this is, we've gone back to this a couple times, not only the inventory, please keep inventory, always a good thing, have conversations. Have conversations with the people who are going to take care of your legacy. What do you want to have done? What do you think is reasonable? Make sure that the expectations are you know, expressed to them. Many children call me up and they say, I have the most amazing lantern slides that my grandfather took in the Alps in the 1920s. I'm like, you are so lucky. And she's like, they must be worth a fortune. I said, let me tell you about eBay. <laughs> um, really, I would love to tell you a different story. Uh, I really would. But those, those are sort of the grandiose expectations. And, and also, many of you, I'm sure, are more than intimate with the um, slide, the financial slide of your industry over the last 10 years. It's a very, very different landscape. And that's not to say that, that work doesn't have value. It's, it has to be considered in different ways. Um, it can be, again, cultural value, historic value. It may not necessarily have financial value in terms of acquisition from the point of view of a museum or an archiving institution, but there are wonderful, special um, you know, exceptions when, when you can get uh, dollars for your work. But more and more we're seeing that dollars need to accompany gifts so that they can take care of of your legacy. So those are the basic points um, I wanted to go over. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. One that goes hand in hand with that idea is that there are some older artists um, who are preparing their estates who might dismiss the value of their collection and their personal work and their collected works and just kind of say, well, the IRS will never know what I've got, so my kids won't have to pay taxes on it, so what's the difference? So the, the question was about individuals, creators, artists, who dismiss the value of their own work as well as the other works that they have collected. Um, the IRS stipulates that an estate tax filing has to be done within nine months of the date of death. You get one six-month extension. Um, as noted earlier, the state exemption value in Washington is just over $2 million per individual and at a federal level currently 5.43. In Oregon, the state um, level is only a million dollars, uh, which can, things can add up pretty quickly when you factor in uh, other assets like real estate, 
and IRAs and life insurance, for example. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, with regards to artist inventory, there is usually this um, option of applying blockage discount. Again, this premise that if you flood the market, I can't do that with other people's work. So as a collector, it's, it's valued at fair market value. And again, depending on where the artist is in their career, if they're alive, you know, is it going to be secondary market auction values? Is it going to be retail values? Um, I had a situation uh, very recently, a colleague called me from Miami, and she was doing an estate appraisal, and they were literally on deadline, and um, I said, <laughs> I hope our clients don't make this a habit. She said the issue was that the heirs, I think it was three sisters, pay the estate taxes based on the insurance appraisal of the photography collection, the photography and the art collection. Again, insurance is highest dollar required in order to replace the piece. So they overpaid. And as a consequence, they realized this, and a month before the deadline, they were having a new appraisal done at fair market value, and were going to lobby the IRS for a refund, which um, I'm not sure how successful. I'm not, I don't think it's going to be quick. Um, so that's a situation where they thought they were taking the easy road, and yet they literally paid for it um, twofold. What's the likelihood of the IRS knowing that your parents have a you know twenty thousand dollar painting in their bedroom? What is the likelihood that the IRS is going to know you have a twenty thousand dollar painting in your bedroom? Um, as an so appraiser, so you don't necessarily know it. As an appraiser, I fear the IRS. Um, <laughs> above all other things. So I'm not, that's really a decision that we'll say as a photographer, you, you just don't value your own work and say, well, you know, it's such okay. a mess, I can't deal okay. with it. And, and really, the, my kids will just take what they like and the rest of it they can throw on the bonfire and who's right. going to know the difference. So they, the, Pick the question goes back to um, the, the artist or photographer doesn't value their own work, it'll get dispersed among the kids, you know, things, you know, all, all is said and done. The issue is going to be have you run your um, creative endeavors as a business? Have you been filing taxes? Have you been, you know, whether you're a sole proprietor, whether you are an LLC, there is going to be that record. Um, so you, you, have, you have that point to deal with. If you are truly a hobbyist and you show at the local cafe once every couple of years and you, know, you don't market your work and you really are just a Sunday photographer, that is probably not going to be an issue. But if you have a sales history, if you have a market history, and you have pursued this in a business fashion, you've had gallery representation, you have to remember if you have a gallery, they have a sales history, they've been filing taxes, you know, etc. So you, you have that history to contend with, and that's what can come back and bite you. Yes. I want to follow up with that. Jane Kinney, who many of you may remember, she spoke a lot on these issues. And she uh, spoke at, at one conference once, and she and Nancy Wolf together, who was the PACA and SPP uh, attorney, uh, talked about separating your images that have sold, your really great images, versus your seconds and similars and sisters and all of that, and keeping them separate. Keep, and that was before digital images were so um, you know, profound. And, 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 and so I think, I don't know what it's like with digital images now, but 
I would think that keeping your digital images that have sold uh, in totally separate folders versus all your seconds and symbols and all of that, that would value the ones that are actually making some money versus all the hundreds or two hundred thousands of other images that really maybe aren't worth it so much. Maybe they're reference prints or reference subjects or seconds or whatever. Yeah. Well, in, in um, well, digital and licensing uh, of images, that's, for me, that's terra incognita. Uh, for me, it's fine art. It's the physical prints. It is an actual object that has been displayed and sold and passed on. And so I'm looking literally at the history of the physical. And so we look at the additions. We see if the edition is sold out. Are prints still available? Where is it in the edition? Etc. cetera. Uh, what is the history? Were, was the artist active and in their heyday 20 years ago but hasn't sold hardly anything within the last five to eight years. And that's gonna make an impact as well. So from a fine art appraisal standpoint, I have physical objects um, that I'm looking at, whereas uh, Ellen, uh, who spoke earlier, of course, her realm is both the primary, the secondary, which ones are generating the most revenue and which ones will likely have long-term appreciation in terms of potentially generating revenue and those that will not. But that's that's a different ballgame. Yeah. You, you, you were talking earlier, you know, the same piece may have multiple values. Correct. And that's something that those of us, you know, who have licensed stock images, uh -huh. for many years when we were sending slides out, we put a delivery memo that said, you lose it, it's 1500 bucks a piece based on sort of this maximum expected value on a high on a high dollar sale, which you want for insurance purposes. However, for estate planning purposes, you want them to be valued at the cost of the film and processing at a dollar a piece. <laughs> okay. So so, so how so how do and so how do you deal with that? You know, we're not talking fine art here, we're talking talking commercial images. Well, again, and you get I'm, in, you I'm, the digital realm, yeah. some of which have been licensed, some of which have, are right. not. Yeah. That's really a question for Ellen um, because we do very different things. The, the types of appraisals that Ellen does in terms of copyright and licensing, essentially the intellect, the, the value of the intellectual property, right. that's more of a business appraisal, and she's doing very specific calculations with that. I am a fine art, I'm a physical, I am history of sales, and is that particular image, that particular piece, from that particular series, et cetera. So our appraisals are actually different. You know, mm -hmm. we pull each other in on jobs like the one, mm -hmm. you know, that was mentioned earlier because this photographer actually worked both sides of the line. Um, and so we needed the skills of the other person for that particular. Um, but in talking to the fine art side in addressing that question about the different values, artists get the short end of the stick without question. Um, with a donation, for example, you can only deduct the cost of materials. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you, if, when you pass, the estate gets taxed at fair market value. And again, the only clause I have is to apply this blockage discount, which again right. deflates it to probably a reasonable level, you know, flooding flooding the market. That's the only tool there is, and I have to be very objective about that. I have to defend it. I have to I mean it needs to stand up in a court of law because if it goes up in front of a judge, it's gonna be scrutinized. Let me ask a follow-up question. On the fine art side, uh -huh. say I'm creating fine art prints, yeah. and I'm printing on demand. You know, I have a library of images people are viewing you know, on, the, on the web. There, and they if say, you don't have like, an inventory, you don't need to call me. So you don't value that original transparency from which the prints are being made or the original digital okay, file. Okay, so the question okay. was, if um, I, I have, I'm a commercial photographer and a fine art photographer, and with my fine art, it's print on demand. It is print as order. Brilliant. Okay. Reason being that, yes, it still has value. I'm going to call Ellen in for that because you have use images, you have this history, 
But in terms of the fine art, you have no inventory. You could have a clause in your will that yes, you allow your heirs or your trustee to continue making posthumous prints. Obviously they won't be signed. Um, so they're not gonna be as valuable. But you do allow the estate to do that and that can perpetuate income for your heirs or your trust or whoever charitable um, uh, organization that you designate. So there is potential income down the road, but as far as I'm concerned, there is no physical inventory, so that's, you don't, you don't need me. Yes? Uh, sort of a follow-up to the follow-up, actually, but it, it raises an interesting question and one that maybe doesn't strictly stick to just the states, but actually uh, photographers who are working now, which mm -hmm. is, if you are doing a print-on-demand, Kind of a situation. How does that affect the value of those prints, especially if it's not a limited number? You know, are you are you truly doing the kind of fine art that you would be appraising and that you know may raise or lower in value, or is it more of a commercial enterprise and not quote unquote fine art as as you would? So the so the question uh, essentially is how. Um, is is the value affected by the fact that the prints are made on demand versus quote unquote fine art? Yeah, or limit the, the or limited or limited edition. editions. Okay, so um, it actually doesn't make a difference. And the reason the reason I say that is because I know fine art photographers who would print on demand, in the sense that a gallery had their book. In the, in the gallery, and a client had seen a show, but they didn't have the photograph of the calla lilies in inventory. So they called the artist, and the artist asked, did the client see the actual photograph in the show that you had last time, or did they see the photograph of the calla lilies in the book? And, the, and, and that was a very important question because the book was printed down. So as a consequence, depending on what print the client had seen first, the photographer would print either to the book or would print to the print, his master print. Does that make sense? All right, so there is a situation where a fine art photographer is literally printing on demand, okay? Limited editions, um, many photographers utilize that as a tool because you can tier your pricing. So it's a tiered price structure. So let's say you have an edition of 50. You, have, you start out at $750 for numbers 1 through 10. And then it jumps to 1200 for 11 through 20, etc. And the edition sells out at $5,000 or $7,000. Okay, so it's a hyper-evolutionary curve of the value of your work, which is fantastic. Now, when you're doing print-on-demand, or when you're just printing for a show, um, and it's an open edition, we call it an open edition when it's not limited. So the price is based on what somebody's willing to pay. So you've decided that your photograph should start at $800 for an 11 by 14. Okay, you sold four or five pieces out of that show or off your website, great. That's an $800 piece. Let's say you jump up the price in two years to $1,200 and you have an exhibit and you don't sell anything you haven't sold anything for a while and that price is not realized so what do you do you probably bring it back down to a thousand and then sales start again so and this is old school this is old school where you are pricing it based on what the market is willing to pay and so that's the record what are people willing to pay and then historically so and you know same same issue if I'm looking back historically you know 
if you were printing gelatin silver, were you doing chromogenic seed prints? Were you doing sebachrome prints? Are you now doing digital? What's the value of what your sebachromes were versus what your digital prints are now? Those are going to be very different. Those actually have truly different values in the marketplace when you're looking at older work. Um, because fine art photography collectors appreciate the older media. It's not guaranteed, um, but with mid-century, early 20th century, mid-century, and even late 20th century photographers who are working in traditional silver-based media, paper-based, etc., those tend to hold more value than when they transferred over and started printing digital. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. It's, it's right. really, you know, the price realized is what its value is. And you, yeah. I'm going to talk right, a little bit about some of the things that affect the price of the actual brick hanging on the wall. So as a collector, I have a brick on the wall. I think I've seen it at a gallery for for four thousand eight hundred dollars. Uh huh. But I don't think the carver's done anything for about ten years. Mm -hmm. This one is not it's edition, but it's like three or four or something. I don't know if it's anything else that's sold. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're saying the IRS, or at least you you can make the case to the IRS that it's not worth four thousand five hundred or four thousand eight hundred dollars just because some gallery says it is, right? Because it's not selling. The 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 question is, um Dunlin has a photograph. Uh the artist hasn't been active for a decade. A gallery currently has the same or similar print in inventory. Same one. Same one in inventory and they have it priced at four thousand eight hundred and he's wondering what the value is for estate tax purposes so if this artist has not been active for 10 years if most of his work is now being sold on the secondary market which i would say auctions for example i would look at the most recent realized prices i am required to include auction comparables in IRS appraisals. Even if I'm looking at a contemporary artist whose best and most common market is retail, and if that ends up being my end number, I still have to include auction comps. I still have to look at the secondary market. So again, what I would do is I would probably call the gallery for the artist's work I would first I would check to see if that particular piece has sold at auction if it has not sold but the artist has had other work from the same era same genre very similar then I use a comparable I would also call the gallery to see if they have sold the artist's work in the past it seems like I see a lot of times previous show 20 images, 40 images, and uh, it made a very museum and then uh, one of the Chelsea galleries will have it, right? Mm -hmm. But three of the images will sell out and at of that sliding scale of right. price. Mm -hmm. And then because everyone loved them, the other person is like it's very not common. Like the same quality. They made a show and they made a nice presentation all together. Mm -hmm. Three sold out and the rest are all, all two of 20, two of four of 20, five of 20. Right. How do you keep that price low when 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 20 of 20 just sold at auction for $100,000, but these others so, are so still at their $5,000 price? So the, the question is um, the individual the ideal comparable is the same image. Right. But I don't always have that ideal comparable. So I have to look at other work, and I call the gallery, I call the artist, and I, I do research on the artist to find out what the comparable images are, 
you know, if what I'm looking at is a sold out piece that was so popular, no one ever wants to let go of that piece so it never shows up on the secondary market because it is so beloved, then I would look at similar works which are as beloved but have shown up on the secondary market. So, you know, comparables do need to be very, very close. So I do try and take good care with that. Um, again, I have to defend my appraisals. They need to stand up in a court of law if necessary. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, I try and be as, as careful and thorough in my due diligence as possible. I think we've yeah. got time for one more yeah. short question. Yeah. Okay. This is a question of timing. Uh, on one hand, if, I'm, if, if I want an appraisal for insurance purposes, I want my thing to be worth $10 million. And if it's for estate tax purposes, I want it to be under $2 million. Do you do these appraisals before or after the event? So the, the question is about timing. And of course, obviously, you want your insurance appraisal to be high. You want your estate Low. And do I have to wait to buy <laughs> and get the wood appraisal or do I get and, the appraisal for insurance before or after? And do I have to wait to die for the um, appraisal to be done for my estate? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. So, <laughs> okay, so there was an easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. So the, the valuation date in an appraisal whether it's an insurance appraisal, a donation appraisal, or an estate appraisal, the valuation date is very, very specific. So with an insurance appraisal, it's generally the date of inspection. The day that I went in there and I documented, inspected all the artwork for condition, annotation, hang on, <laughs> and, and I documented all of the artwork, so let's say, on March 3rd, I went to your home and I documented all the artwork that you wanted to have insured. Okay, and then I went home and I started working on your insurance appraisal. And I delivered it on April 3rd and you got it and you were ecstatic and you turned it into your insurance broker. Okay, then your house burned down on May 3rd. Okay. Now you have a basis, and the adjuster and your insurance company says, all right, we have this document from a certified appraiser. These were the values. It's within a, literally a month of when the house burned down. We have eliminated any dubious circumstances in connection <laughs> with this house fire. And so we're going to compensate you so that you can replace those. So I want to have that appraisal done. Before something happens. Before yes. something happens. Please, that would be ideal. Okay. Working retroactively is challenging. I'm actually uh, have a client now who it's a loss appraisal. And there are so many extraordinary conditions um, and assumptions because I am relying on my client's memory. My client has gone through the book of, of Felix Beato and other photographers, and he said, I had that one, and I had that one, and I had that one. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, but it is made exceptionally clear in the document, I did not personally inspect these. I am relying on the client's memory. This is an appraisal for loss, and it is going to go to court because he's trying to get compensated from the insurance company. And again, those are extraordinary circumstances. With the estate appraisal, yes, I understand the estate wants a low number, but I do not have the credentials MAI, which is what real estate appraisers used to have. If you understand the SNL fallout of the late 1980s, you understand that part of what contributed to that were overinflated real estate values because real estate appraisers were basing their fee on the value of the property they were assessing. We are not allowed to do that. We have to be as objective as possible. So while yes, I understand what the estate wants, 
that's not my concern. I'm an objective party, and I'm doing my research and due diligence and coming up with a fair market value that is reasonable and based on the most common market for the artist's work. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your Thank time. You. I really appreciate it.